Hello everyone, welcome to the video. Today we are doing a wrap up of all the books I read in June. I don't know what it was about this month, but I read a lot and I think, I'll go into it, but I think there were a couple of books that, number one, a couple of books that I skimmed and we'll talk about that, but also I read quite a few more um, shorter books. So yeah, I have a lot to talk about and I have a lot of, I'll give you a little teaser. I have a lot of physical books. I can hold them in my hand while I tell you about them. Isn't that weird? So anyway, um, before we dive right into it though, hello, I'm getting a call from Carrie from the future. Let me pass it over to her. Thanks, Carrie. Hi team, how are you? Um, this video is sponsored by the wonderful, the incredible, the book of the month. Yes, book of the month. Um, you guys know them, you guys love them. Book of the month, if you don't know, is a really wonderful service in which there are a team of readers that go through all of the new releases and it could be from debut authors, it could be from authors that you know and love, and they pick some of the best books of the month and then you as a subscriber will be able to choose one or more of your favorites for one low controlled price. They also now have a podcast, which is really exciting. They're just a really wonderful team. Some of my favorite books have been from book of the month they also shout out they just got a new box design it's a little bit smaller sleeker um shout out to whoever did that and as always you can use my code carry to get your first book for $9.99 and that is for a newly released hardcover book they will all be hardcover incredible so what did I choose from their picks this month I got Hello Stranger by Catherine Center. All I know about this book is that it's about an artist who suddenly gets facial blindness. I think it's a romance. I think it's cute. There's a dog on the cover. So I'm sort of like, I feel like it's gonna be a hit. But within this box contains the book that I am so excited to get my hands on. Yes, I finally got my hands on Immortal Longings by Chloe Gong. I was a fan of her first duology, but I think the story just didn't super connect with me um, in the second book. I love the first book. Um, so I know that I like her writing style, um, but I'm really interested to see it in a different setting that isn't a Romeo and Juliet retelling. And look at the cover. Isn't that gorgeous? So if you would like this book or any of the... <laughs> What are you trying to tell me, Book of the Month? So again, if you would like to get this book or any of the others, check out all of the listings for the month. Um, use my code Carrie. That information will be down below. So thank you as always to Book of the Month for sponsoring. And back to the video. Thank you, Carrie. Always a pleasure. Let's dive in. Starting with the books. I say this every month, <laughs> but the books from the beginning of the month, it feels like I read them ages and ages and ages ago. I did actually look at my list before I started filming so that I could like remember everything that <laughs> I read. So hopefully I can talk about things well, but here we go. The first book I read in June is The Name Drop. Um, this is my friend, Susan. This is her second book. It is a young adult contemporary romance. Susan is obsessed with K-dramas. So this is very much written as a K-drama. I would love to see this actually put to the screen. Um, it is a case of mistaken identity. It is a summer internship. We have our main boy who is the son of the CEO of the company and then we have our girl who is the daughter of like a low-level employee in the company and she wants to do really well in this internship he is just there to kind of like please his father and they have the same Korean name and so when their roles get switched and he all of a sudden is in this like stupid internship you know those summer internships where like they just like go get coffee you know He's stuck in there. She's in this like executive in training position and they're kind of like, we dig these roles. Would you mind just pretending 
to be each other for a summer. As you can imagine, it becomes a little bit messy. Um, it takes place in New York City. I thought it was cute. I think if specifically if you are a K-drama fan, you can see it playing out in your head really well. It did have like a lot of the K-drama cliches, so I would go into it knowing that, but I had a good time. There were a couple times that I laughed out loud. And yeah, this comes out in September. So this is not out yet. This was a arc. September 12th comes out September 12th. That was the first book I read. <laughs> oh my gosh. And then after that, I read this in one sitting that was slightly interrupted by me having to get off the bus and come back and sit on my couch, okay? I read Yellowface. Oh goodness. So at this point now, Yellowface has been out for a while and I've seen... I haven't watched any people's reviews on it, but I have seen like YouTube thumbnails of people having very different reactions. And I think the issue I see other people having with it, first and foremost, I enjoyed. Like I said, one and a half sittings, okay? I think that people read Babel, which was very, very like so research heavy. It was intense. There was so much history to it. And then when we hear about Yellowface, where it's also the main theme is about racism, this time in the publishing industry, people might have expected like a similar writing style. And this is a comedy. This is, this is such like a fluff. No, I don't want to say fluff because that usually has a negative connotation, but like this is a book that for such a serious topic isn't necessarily to be taken seriously. It's supposed to be horrific, but kind of funny, like darkly, deeply funny. I think that RF Kuang is brilliant. There were shots fired for everyone in the publishing industry, including herself, I think. There's a point, oh, well, let me tell you what the book is about. So Yellowface is about a woman who was kind of friends, like low-key frenemies with this very successful author. They kind of grew up together um, through like university and various writing workshops. They were always just like together. And our main girl is a white woman who I forget exactly what genre she really writes. And then her friend is an Asian woman who has had great success, okay? They've been doing everything together and then one person just skyrockets. When there is an unfortunate incident, our white woman finds the almost completely finished first draft of a book that her friend was working on, takes it, edits it up, and passes it off as her own. Um, and then we just go through that whole journey with her, okay? I mean, it's called Yellow Face. Like it was very much talking about racism in the publishing industry, but it wasn't just like focused. All of the commentary wasn't just focused on like this white woman author. It was coming after everyone involved and even the kind of friend character she isn't the hero of the story. She's a little, like, a human. She's not perfect. And the way that she was described as being, like, this cool, pretty, smart chick, I was sort of like, RF Kong, is that you? <laughs> and she wrote that woman as, again, an imperfect person. So, like, she also wasn't holding back the shots about herself and her role in the industry, too. So I think that the way that it was marketed was definitely, like, ooh, watch out. Like, we're coming for you white people, but it was like, no, watch out everybody. Like, we're coming for all of you. I also would love to know. So again, I so I enjoyed it and it wasn't that serious. I think that there were a lot of people that were saying like, oh, it's just this mediocre book. It wasn't great writing. It wasn't meant to be some like incredible work of literature. I think RF Kuang was just having a really good time writing it. And at this moment in time, only she could write it. And for her to write it and it, it get as big as it is and her to be allowed to write it, you know, I really, really enjoyed it and learned a lot about publishing in the process, which was crazy. I would love to know though, if you guys picked this up, she was very vague. She never like named names, but there was one point where she talks about an editor. She mentioned that like this editor is a woman, but she tries to silence women that write with a more like feminist lens. And she said that this editor recently worked on a book. She, she had like a book about this, this, and this. And the third example was a book about a famous pianist that sells her soul to the devil for fame or something like that. And I think she even mentioned aliens. And that is 
light from uncommon stars. Why would she make such a specific fake book plot for this editor, this fake editor to be working on? That seemed really like if anybody is in the know, they would know who she was talking about. I'm not in the know, so I, I don't know, but I read that and I was like, oop, whoever is like in the credits for Light From Uncommon Stars better watch out because that's Light From Uncommon Stars. Did anyone else pick that up? Anyway, I, I enjoyed it. Again, I don't think it needs to be and can really be taken as a piece of like serious literature and commentary or whatever. It was just a good time and I appreciated it. So that was Yellow Face. <laughs> After that, I have another physical book. I read My Best Friend's Exorcism by, where is he? Grady Hendrix. I literally just wanted it because of the cover. Isn't that fantastic? There are so many details. Like, it's just so good. This is my third Grady Hendrix book. I read the Southern Book Club Vampire Slaying one, which I enjoyed. I read the Final Girl Support Group, which was okay, but I think this one might be my favorite so far. This is just a complete take on the 80s. It was so good. I thought that once the... so it's... it's... I mean, it's not a lie. It is about her best friend getting possessed <laughs> by, the, by the devil. Yeah, it's just like these teenage girls in the 80s and one of them gets possessed. Um, I think that once it, once the possession actually happens and she starts to be like a demon, it gets a little, I was a little like, okay, let's wrap this up. But I just thought that the atmosphere of this book was incredible. It's, it's absolutely horror. So if you are not okay with like a lot of bodily fluids and stuff, um, avoid. This is as funny as it is. It's also just a horror novel. I talk a bit more about it in my reading vlog where I conquer my physical TBR and I read only physical books for a week. So I do think like just as a little bit of a warning, um, these are teenagers from the 80s and so there are a few remarks that you're sort of like, Eey. when they say goodbye to each other, they say like, oh, love you dearly but not queerly. It's kind of like how in the early 2000s people would say no homo. Stuff like that where it's like, we wouldn't be saying this in this decade, um, but it was never malicious, but just to, just as like a little warning. Anywho, my best friend's exorcism. <laughs> After that, I ate up a trilogy. After I posted my video about my reaction to Fourth Wing, which I thought was fine, I got so many comments from people saying I needed to read Fireborn and it's called like the Aurelian trilogy, I think. So I did. I read them so good. Okay, so if you guys read Fourth Wing and you were like, I loved the world, but the romance was like a little weird, Fireborn. Fireborn is about a world where there was recently a revolution that overthrew the, I think it was called the Triarchy, so there wasn't a monarchy, there were three ruling families, a Triarchy, and there was a very bloody revolution in which the revolutionaries killed at, oh my god, he's like Anastasia. Okay, this isn't, this isn't a spoiler because it happens in the first chapter. There is one person who is allowed to live and it's our main boy. So yeah, it's like Anastasia's story, oh my god. It follows the world kind of a decade after the revolution. We have a group of dragon riders who are like the soldiers um and this will be the first graduating class since the revolution i really loved it it's a lot of political intrigue i will say that the last books get a little choppy because we're introduced to a lot of povs so it is very pov switchy but i thought that it was really well constructed really well paced i loved so many of the characters and i thought it was a book that actually talks about how like sometimes revolutions aren't good and you can try, you can start things meaning well and you can lose the plot, how you have to kind of change what you believe in and keep checking in with yourself. Like it was just, I thought it was really good. There's also, it feels like a bit more dragon stuff. Like I know in Fourth Wing, the dragons can talk. There is still kind of an element of that. I felt like it was more 
there was more dragon stuff going on. I really, really liked it, guys. And then I posted a reel about it on Instagram and the author reached out and was like, hey, just wanted to thank you and everybody else who's been talking about it. Like the book is picking up steam again because these books came out, I think 2019, I think it was 19, 20, 21, but she was just really grateful. So that those thanks are sent to everybody in the comments who made me read it. I think it's climb. it's like in the top 10 bestsellers now for like YA dystopian books um, on, on Kindle. Like it's, we're doing the thing guys. So yeah, I, I really, I ate it up. Um, I didn't want to stop. And so that is the Fireborn trilogy. Thank you to everyone who told me to read it because I enjoyed and I was having issues with fantasy books recently so um that was a nice that was a nice one. Fireborn! <laughs> Kurt, do you have your fish book? Okay for the next one I'm cheating this is actually Kurt's physical book. I read this as an ebook but isn't the Korean cover beautiful? This is Why Fish Don't Exist by Lulu Miller. Kurt picked this up and told me that I should read it, and so I did. This is a memoir. It's a memoir, but it's also like weirdly a biography. How do I describe this? Um, it follows Lulu Miller, our author, um, as she is going through a lot of hardships in her life. And during this time, she discovers this one particular scientist who is known for, he was the first president of Stanford, and he was known for like discovering a shit ton of fish like that was his thing is he would just go all over the world and catalog all of these fish and the thing that really struck her about him was that he had all of these like catastrophes happen in his life where this was in the 1800s so he wrote everything by hand and then everything burnt down and he just started again you know um, and that happened quite a few times where things would burn down or be lost and he just got back up again and she was really fascinated by this and like how he just kept getting back up. So the story begins with his story and he seems like such a happy-go-lucky just like curious young man and so I'm really rooting for him and I'm really enjoying the story and then it turns out he's actually like a big bigot and eugenicist so the story got very dark and so for me personally it like the end the middle to the end was not super enjoyable just because I didn't like reading about a eugenicist but it did have a lot of commentary on life and curiosity and exploration and I guess just like how nature works I think that humans a lot of times we view ourselves as separate from nature but as kind of looking at nature and how silly and imperfect nature is um, it makes us whenever we are silly and imperfect kind of feel a little bit better um, so yeah I think overall like if you're interested in science and nature and history um, this is a good book but definitely beware that there's a lot of talk a lot of talk about eugenics forced sterilizations um, not bright things in here but definitely um kurt really really enjoyed it i would still recommend it as well um fish don't exist i have the air conditioner on and i'm sweating after that i was on my memoir kick and i read page boy very quickly this is elliot page's memoir speaking of dark i was not prepared for how dark this was going to be. It basically just follows his life, his childhood in Canada, all the way up to now. Um, and it is really, really dark. I thought that there were a lot of really beautiful um, reflections and some of it was honestly just dark and difficult to read. It felt a little bit like I'm glad my mom died, where it's another story of like a child actor going through just loads of shit that's what page boy was as well it was yeah just like buckle up i i was not prepared for how gruesome and graphic it was gonna be but i always loved i mean juno was such a big part of my high school experience so reading about that and like what was going on behind the scenes and all of this stuff um just mind-boggling and there was a lot of talk of 
the importance of nature and human connection and, and how you find your peace and who you are and stuff like that. So I think it had a lot in it. It was just like a rough reading experience. But again, I, I did think that as a memoir, it was engaging the whole time. It felt very true to his voice. And yeah, not something that I would reread, but as someone who has loved Elliot Page's work, I'm glad that I read it. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> Page Boy by Elliot Page. After that, there is a book that has been sitting in my Kindle for a very long time. It was on, yeah, it's on Kindle Unlimited and I saw someone post something. They're like a huge A Court of Thorns and Roses fan and they were like, this is so much better. If you like Akutar, like I think this is even better. And you guys know me, like when I first read Akutar, I really enjoyed it actually. It was one of the first fantasies I read since like starting reading again, like since when I was in high school. So it hit me really hard and I always thought like if there were a better version of that, I would enjoy it. So whenever I like don't have anything to read, I'm like, let me look for these books that are compared to A Court of Thorns and Roses. So I downloaded it from Kindle Unlimited and it has been sitting on my Kindle for a very long time. I didn't have any books to read, so I decided to read that. It is the Trial of the Sun Queen. <laughs> I read the first one and the second one. Mm, guys, uh, we start off in a prison and our main girl has been there for forever and she gets horribly abused. Like it's just this horrible, horrible situation. And then she does something really bad one day, really bad, not, not bad. Um, but she gets sent out to the pit to be punished. And while she is in the pit, there is some kind of crazy riot that happens in the prison and the guards are distracted and something with wings swoops into the pit and takes her away. Oh, that's what it was. Okay, I no, 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 I took a picture of it because I was like, what the actual hell? So. I heard about this book in the context of it's better than A Court of Thorns and Roses, right? The blurb about this book, Trial of the Sun Queen, the blurb says, The Bachelor meets The Hunger Games. 10 women, a deadly contest. Only one can win the Sun King's heart. That's what it is. Yeah, so it's compared to A Court of Thorns and Roses, The Bachelor, AKA The Selection, and The Hunger Games. I was like, I gotta know. So yeah, they she gets to the Sun King's palace and they're like, surprise, he needs to pick a bride. So we're having our trials and we need representative from every kingdom, including the prison. <laughs> and there we go. It it unfolds from there. Um, it's, it was stupid. You can give it a try. Like it didn't put me in a reading slump. It passed the time. There were just elements that I think she didn't think about. Like I remember kind of wanting to give up on this when I read this one line. There's the sun area and then there's the aurora area. And the whole thing with the aurora is that it's dark there, but there's the Northern lights. So the sky is always like crazy colors. And there was a line that was like, I forget the girl's name, but she was like, I looked deep into his eyes that were as dark as the Aurora sky. And I'm like, so not dark? The Aurora sky is green, what? So there were just like these details that really took me out of the story. And uh, so I would still say like, if, if that, like A Court of Thorns and Roses, The Bachelor, The Hunger Games, piqued your interest and you have Kindle Unlimited, check it out. It wasn't good. The second one is like Smut City. I would just like you to know, Smut City. But give it, give it a go. If you were to purchase it with your own money, I would say don't. But that was The Trial of the Sun Queen 1 and 2 and I will not be continuing to 3 because... <laughs> After that, I think I took a break from reading and then a hold, a book I've been waiting on for many, many weeks. I think it was like a 16 week hold or something like that. Finally came in and I read Burial Rites by Hannah Kent, I think is her name. <sighs> first, first of all, I liked it. So the sigh is frustration for other things. I didn't know going into it that this was a true story. So I could have saved myself a lot of pain had I read the Wikipedia page. And it is about the, well, that's, is that a spoiler? See, now I don't know what is a spoiler. Like, I feel like most people go into it being spoiled because they know it's a true story, but I didn't, so I don't wanna tell you. It is about a woman living in Iceland and she is one of the last people who was ever 
sentenced to death in Iceland. This book was fictionalized so it reads as if you're reading uh, just the story of this woman's life. It taught me a lot about the older, not current, but like older Icelandic laws and the absolutely crazy ways that they had to do their like criminal investigations and stuff. Like their Supreme Court was in Denmark, so they had to like wait for those judges to get back to them, but then they don't have prisons, so where do they put the prisoners? So we follow this woman as she's waiting for her death sentence, um, and she has to live in just a family's house because they don't have prisons. So we follow her through that, where she's basically accepted that she's gonna die. Everyone thinks that she's this crazy, crazy psychopath murderess, and then maybe she's not. I thought that it had a lot of really good female rage. I think if you like reading about that, it was not only she was angry, but like as I was reading it, I was getting really angry. I believe that this started as the author's dissertation or something. She studied abroad in Iceland, heard about this story, and was so interested in it that she made this like her life, and I think that this book is kind of the product of if not is the actual dissertation, it's the product of all of the research she did for that. Just very interesting. I really enjoyed it. It was short and it was rough. Definitely be in the right headspace for it, but yeah, burial rites, feminine rage, highly recommend. After that, to lift my spirits, I read love theoretically. You guys know that I love laughing at Ali Hazelwood's <laughs> descriptions of men and she knows what she's doing. So this, I was so excited. It was another giant man. I loved. Um, so Love Theoretically is about a woman who, what is she? She's like an adjunct professor and she hates it. She doesn't like being a teacher. She wants to be a researcher and she is up for, um, it's between like her and one other candidate for this position that she really, really wants. When she gets to the interview, she realizes she's fucked because she has a side gig because education does not pay a living wage. Her side gig is she is a fake girlfriend for hire. Like if you need a date to a wedding, if you need a this or that. Um, and she's not supposed to go on repeat dates, but there's this one guy who she really likes um, as a friend. He really needs her help. So she has become his like unofficial fake girlfriend for family events. Um, and his brother is interviewing her. Um, so it, as you can imagine, gets really messy really fast. This book, my only, I don't want to call it a complaint because I would love to see more of this, but like maybe a little bit more subtle. A lot of this book felt like kind of a handbook for how a relationship with a lot of communication and talk about consent should be. So it kind of took me out of the story a little bit because there was, it felt like Ali was kind of telling us like, hey, by the way, like to be a good partner, you should be checking in and like they're, for various reasons, like both of them, they need to have serious talks and I agree, but um, this just felt a little bit like like I said, kind of like a handbook of how you, of what a good relationship should look like. I didn't fall into it as much. I think that her other books are like silly. This one felt a little bit more like, okay guys, but let's talk about how to actually be like responsible. But I, st I, you know, I still enjoyed it. I read it in one sitting, it was fine. I think that she knows what she can do and she hits those every time. Like, you know what you're getting when you're reading an Allie Hazelwood book. However, she just announced that she's working on a, werewolf <laughs> i'm so stoked you have no idea i'm so excited to see what she does yeah she's coming out with a like a werewolf romance book and you best believe i'm gonna eat that up so love theoretically like if you don't like ali hazelwood don't read it if you enjoyed if you had a good time with her other books read it simple as that Love theoretically. <laughs> After that, I read The Parasites. I got this at a used bookstore in Tokyo and I just loved the cover. And this is the author of Rebecca, which I love. So I thought I would give it a shot. I would never have read it otherwise. This book is about three siblings. Their parents are artists. I think their father is a singer and their mother is a dancer. They put on shows together. So they're constantly traveling the world. They live a very luxurious kind of frivolous life. The story starts um, present day. When does this take place? This is like in the 19, I think it's the like the 10s, 20s, 
30s or is this World War II? It's one of the World Wars. I'm so sorry. This is it's been a while since I read this, but it takes place when they are kind of in the present and then they're constantly looking back and talking about um, childhood memories. Overall, I, I really liked the beginning. I would say like 50%. I enjoyed the atmosphere. It was just very like, again, this lavish luxe lifestyle in the early 1900s. You know, a lot of like French villas on the sea. But as it continued, it got a little bit old. And the reason it's called The Parasites is because the main girl's husband calls her and her two siblings parasites. But as you kind of read the book, you realize that everyone is just kind of a parasite of each other, or that's what I got from the book, is that they take from everyone else, everyone else takes from them. Yeah, I'm, I wouldn't say I would rush to read this. I wouldn't read this again. I wouldn't even compare it to Rebecca. Rebecca is like, completely different level. It wasn't, wasn't my favorite, but I did finish it, and I was proud of myself for doing that, so. After that, real quick, I read a very short book called Exciting Times. This is by an Irish author and it follows an Irish woman who moves to Hong Kong to teach English. And at first I thought like, Ooh, I don't know how I'm gonna like this because I'm not like the biggest fan of people using teaching English abroad as like a fun time, like kind of a paid vacation. And that's kind of what it felt like. Like she was like, fuck it, I'll go to Hong Kong because anybody who speaks English can get a job easily. So reading the first chapter, I was not sure how I wanna read, like if I wanna continue, but she ends up not even really talking about her job as an English teacher. She meets this British guy who is a banker. They have this really weird friendship that goes on and develops. Um, and I ended up really liking that commentary. For such a short book, I thought that it was very insightful in terms of how honest she was about like the tiny things that she hates about herself, the things that she hates that she loves, the emotions that she wishes she didn't feel. The second I started getting bored with it, we were introduced to a new character and I felt a lot less bored. So overall, it like wasn't my favorite read, but I recommend if that, um, strikes your fancy. Next up, as you can see, not finished. I started to read, I went to see my father. I got to page 102. <laughs> the chapters are all like 50 to 60 pages long, so I read two chapters. I really enjoyed the first 100 pages, but it's just a very heavy book in terms of it's very sad. Um, there's just a lot of emotions and I just wasn't in the space to continue it and I didn't want to force myself to keep reading it um, and then end up not enjoying it because I wasn't, you know, ready for it. But this is about a woman who lives in Seoul and her family lives in the countryside. She very rarely goes to see them, but her mother had to come to Seoul to get some kind of medical thing done and has to stay there for a while. So her sister and her mother went up there. Her father is alone in the countryside house. So she goes to check up on him and we go through kind of her childhood experiences with her dad her dad's life experiences, living through the Korean War, stuff like that. I said this in my reading vlog, but like my chest just felt tight the whole time. If that sounds like it is interesting to you, the writing is good. It's very much, I again, talk about it more in my reading vlog, but every thought flows into the next thought. So there's not a lot of places that you feel comfortable stopping. It's like, once you start reading, you have to read for 50 pages straight <laughs> or else like you're, it feels like you're kind of cutting her off in the middle of a, of a thought. So I didn't love that, but I will finish this one day. <laughs> I went to see my father. After that, um, one of my friends started a readathon with just herself and one of her friends. Um, and I joined where we are going to be reading pirate books for the month of July and I cheated and I got a head start and I read Dark Shores. This is by the same author as The Bridge Kingdom, which I did not know um, as I was reading it, but 
Dark Shores is a kind of piratey themed book that is also a fantasy. I lost the plot of this book. I thought that the beginning was really interesting and then it hit this point where I was reading and all of a sudden I was like, what is going on? Like I completely lost the plot. Basically in our world, there is one kingdom that is colonizing every piece of land that they can get their hands on, but there is a sea that is very treacherous and it is people think that there's nothing on the other side of that sea but there is there's a whole other landmass over there but it's only this one particular group of people who know how to navigate the sea to get there so there's some hullabaloo where our main girl is forced to betray her people and show them how to get through the sea and it's just it just wasn't a good time like i said i think up until the point where they left for her to like show them how to cross the sea i was into it like there's her best friend is being forced to marry this evil man and so we're trying to save her and the male i assume romantic love interest is this like weird tortured soul kind of guy i don't know there was a lot of potential and then once the story actually like the adventure started i lost the plot i was like what is going on on actually and i can't even tell you because i don't even know so i really didn't enjoy dark shores and i feel like people i had some comments when i said i didn't enjoy the bridge kingdom or it was just like mid people said oh dark shores is better but i would argue that the bridge kingdom at least made sense in terms of the plot i feel like the whole like three quarters of the book of dark shores made no sense to me whatsoever so let me know if you had that experience or if i just like read it wrong i don't know but yeah dark shores was so confusing and put me kind of in a reading slump so just a warning there that was dark shores <laughs> in order to break my reading slump i bought a 12 dollars book that i read in like an hour and 40 minutes i finally read lemon um, this is a very short book. It's a hundred and forty pages. It is about a girl whose older sister was murdered when they were in high school and where this book isn't about solving the crime. It's more about just the aftermath of um, how her sister's life is changed, how the friends of the sister and stuff like that it's three povs i thought it was good for a for a book to tell me this much in 140 pages i enjoyed it but that being said like it was very dark it's just kind of talking about grief and anger and envy yeah i don't know how to describe it but i um I liked this book like I, I went to the bookstore immediately went to a starbucks and sat down and ate breakfast and finished it while eating breakfast so um i feel like that says something about the book for you but yeah lemon and because i was still a little bit in the throes of that reading slump thanks a lot dark shores i picked up god i told myself i wouldn't do this after vampire academy but i picked up a book based off of a reel i know on instagram i saw a reel i'm not going to tell you what i saw because it actually was a major spoiler for the book so i'm surprised that this person did this but yeah it's a major spoiler so i'm not going to tell you but the book is called better than the movies um i find that a rom-com is good when i'm having trouble reading so picked this one up it's definitely young adult it's definitely a little childish i know that i just said it's young adult but like this felt like if i were a high school student having a fantasy about fake dating i would come up with this book like it was very much like it popped out of the mind of a high school girl which i don't know if that's a good or bad thing it made the reading experience a little silly but um overall it's about a girl who is going to high school she's obsessed with romantic comedies because her mom passed away in an accident when she was quite young and the thing that they shared was a love of romantic comedies and so that's her obsession i think it's her senior year of high school and this boy that used to be her neighbor that she had a huge crush on when she was like five came back to school and she's like this is our meet cute again this is our destiny and we're gonna go to prom together and he's gonna fall in love with me and this is gonna be my story but in order to get him to realize that she's not 
the little girl he played hide and seek with anymore. She enlists the help of her other neighbor and best friend of this guy to fake date her and make him a little bit jealous. They, these two, are like notorious enemies. They're constantly fighting over the one parking spot in their neighborhood, so they kind of hate each other, but they put their differences aside to fake date, and it's, you know, you know how it's gonna go. It was fine. Like I said, it felt like the daydream of a high school student, so the plot was like not all there, but it was absolutely fine and past the time, and so if you need a, a romantic comedy to read, like you've got a long flight or a long car ride or something, better than the movies. Delivered what I needed it to, totally fine. <laughs> We're almost done, I promise. So after that, again, I just was kind of grabbing for any book that I felt could get me back into reading. So, so many people had been recommending this in my comment section. So I finally decided to read The Prison Healer Trilogy. This was a series that I wish had been edited down. The first book, well, let me tell, let me tell you what it's about. So we follow a girl who is thrown into a very deadly prison, kind of like Trials of the Sun Queen, but she was put in there as a child um, with her father and her father passed away and so she took on his role of being the prison healer. So she's like the nurse of the prison, right? One day a mysterious prisoner arrives along with a note that says, keep her alive, we're coming to get you. And so she believes that she has family on the outside that's going to eventually try to get her out, but it's been 10 years. So I feel like maybe she should have given up hope, but she is like, no, I'm going to keep this prisoner alive no matter what. And that includes risking her life to take part in these trials, which it gets, it gets explained, so I don't want to go too far into it, but she basically has to go through a lot of ordeals um, in order to try and protect this prisoner who she doesn't know, but she just has this image that like this is going to help her escape, right? The entire first book should have been 50% of what it was and it should have been combined with the second book. Um, this was how do I even explain this? Minor spoiler incoming. Timestamp on the screen. Like the whole thing about the trials, I just wish that she had found another way. Basically like the trials exist, exist so that we can learn things about the characters, obviously, right? I wish she had found any other way to do it because we did not need to drag it out so long. And all that did was make me hate our main character because the girl, this isn't, I don't think this is a spoiler, but the girl doesn't do anything herself. Like if we're talking about the Hunger Games or like anything that has these kind of trials, right? The character should be able to like pull a crazy stunt and save herself or like be, find some hidden strength or like whatever. The whole first book, our main girl does nothing. She's a great nurse. That's a superpower in and of itself, all right? She's a great healer. But everything else that she does is like, helped by other people like she doesn't do anything and it kind of continues throughout the whole book like all our main character does is like get help from random other people just because they they see potential in her and then she's very very naive and a little bit brainwashed and she like causes problems the whole book like that's all she does the whole book and it really drive me it really drove me crazy because i just wanted her to do something so overall, like I, the, the next two books, I was interested in the world. There was political intrigue. Um, it's all about like who are the rightful rulers of the kingdom, all of this stuff. I also enjoyed particularly one character is like very funny. Absolutely loved him. Whenever he was on the page, I was happy. I just don't know why she wrote the first book that way because I know that she wanted, she has like, I, she has a reason for pacing it the way that it did, but I think that had she rearranged some of the plot points, it would have hit harder and felt less drawn out and less... Honestly, the first book just felt kind of stupid. Like after I read it and I reflected on it, and especially after finishing the series and looking back onto the first book, it just felt like this kind of extra limb, like it didn't need to be there. So 
I liked the next two books, but the first book of The Prison Healer really turned me off and turned me off of the character. So let me know your thoughts. What do you think about Kiva? Just let me know your thoughts about Prison Healer. It was easy to read, it was quick to read, but I felt like the first book was a waste of my time. Let me know, what was your favorite book in the series? <laughs> next up, really quick, this was an incredibly short collection of poetry is it um this was split tooth which is written by an inuk throat singer um but it is about her upbringing i'm not sure if this is if all of it is her or if some of it is a character but some of it reads like a memoir some of it reads very much as just very quick very dark poetry there's a lot of magical realism in it it is incredibly dark I must warn you, um, from page one, there is sexual assault, sexual abuse um, of children. It is graphic. There is drug abuse, alcohol abuse, physical abuse, everything in between. But I do think that it was a perspective that I haven't read a, a lot of. I haven't read almost any indigenous voices from Canada. So she did mention residential schools. There was just incredibly beautiful imagery of the ice and the northern lights and how she views life and death and energy and the connection of things. There were these really beautiful moments but a lot of really dark stuff. So um, if that sounds interesting to you, I would definitely recommend it, but be aware. Look up the trigger warnings ahead of time, please. And last two, I did read Violets. This is by the same author as I went to see my father, but I actually did finish this. This one felt a lot easier to read. It still had a lot of darkness to it, but it wasn't quite the same flavor of darkness or like emotional content um as i went to see my father so this follows one woman who we first meet her when she is a child living in the countryside where she has this moment with her best friend and they suddenly have a falling out and that is kind of the catalyst for her she always felt kind of out of place but with her friend she felt she finally found some kind of connection to the world around her and then she was just kind of sent off again to feel very detached. Her mother is also like not very present. We meet up with her again when she is older. She is living in Seoul and she gets a job at a flower shop and then we just follow her through that period in her life. I actually really enjoyed it. I loved the character of the other woman who runs the flower shop. It also all took place in the one particular area that I'm in a lot so it was very funny to have her use very specific places she would walk home from work and she'd be like she would turn here and then she would go here and here and here and i would be like oh okay i know exactly where she is that was sort of fun just as someone like if you've been to seoul or lived in seoul and you know the guanghamun samchongdong area that's where it all takes place like the sejong art center stuff like that but i thought that it was very beautiful very melancholy um but i recommend violets if you couldn't get through I went to see my father. This one is much more digestible. <laughs> and then our very last book, I promise you, I thought I was gonna end with The Prison Healer. And then I just like kept sliding in all these books at the very end. The last day of June, I read in one day The Garden of the Cursed. I think it was an Instagram account I really love, Peculiar Pages. She got I guess she got an arc of this and she was talking about how she enjoyed it. Um, so I immediately picked it up. I, I knew and I knew ahead of time that this was part of an unfinished duology. So I knew what I was getting myself into. So this is an unfinished series. It just came out like June 20th or something. So we have to wait a long time. Garden of the Cursed was a cute, fun little time. It is about a world where there is kind of the five ruling families um, and they, each have five different libraries that control their own spell collection, spell books. How am I, I'm not describing this well at all, what the heck? Um, let me start over. We follow a girl named Marlo who is a curse breaker. She gets hired by people who have had curse, curses placed on them and she runs around and finds whoever did it and then burns the curse card. So all of the magic in this world is placed in these cards and so you can buy them or you can make them you can just like kind of like pokemon like you can just pull out a card 
and say the magic word and throw it and the magic will hit the person you intend, you know? So I really love that. Like, it felt like a kind of new magic system that I hadn't really seen before. And Marlo, her mother, used to be the chevalier for one of the five ruling families. So she grew up going to kind of like royal school and living in the palaces and stuff like that. And then her mom mysteriously disappeared. And the only thing her mom ever taught her was, if I ever go missing, get the fuck out of the royal sector. You know, go back to the marshes where she grew up. So she does what she's told, she left that life behind, until one day her former best friend, who is the heir to one of the royal families, shows up her at her door and is like, hey girl, I got a curse for you to break. I thought the world itself, like the, de the descriptions of the city, um, the city itself was really interesting, and also it's got fake dating. So, I talked about this on Instagram, but I think that the cover makes the book look way, way, way more intense than it is. There is intensity and like gang warfare and fights and death and stuff like that, but the actual characters are very cute and lovable and sarcastic and funny. It's a lot lighter than I think the cover makes it seem like, and it's got yearning and fake dating and romance, you know? So I highly recommend it. It was for someone who had been kind of striking out with fantasies towards the end of the month. Garden of the Cursed was a great change of pace. It wasn't the best fantasy I've ever read, like it was a little bit predictable, whatever, but it scratched whatever itch I needed it to. So I'm definitely looking forward to the sequel. That was how I ended the month. So Carrie, do you have anything to say? Thank you again to Book of the Month and my code Carrie will be down in the description box. You can get your first book for $9.99 and that's it from me. <laughs> and my voice is completely shot, so I will end the video here. I will see you guys later. Let me know what you have been reading, what I should be reading. Let me know your thoughts on all the books I have mentioned, especially Prison Healer for those of you who recommended it. What do you think? I apologize if my opinion lets you down, um, but I'm glad that you enjoyed it. And yeah, I will catch you guys next time, okay? Bye!